The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning and welcome, Southside Bible Church. Grateful for any visitors. Always nice to have you here and the family as we worship that great name. Uh, excited about those three young ladies who want to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a joy to hear Joel's daughter pour out her heart before God before we came out to be baptized in the depth of her love for Christ. Just oozed out of her prayer. It was absolutely beautiful. Well, guys, if you'll turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Last week, we finished up this deep, rich section of verses 1 through 11. Uh, we kind of pulled out and and now this morning, I want to look at the, the big picture of the letter again, and then we'll narrow back down. But Peter's desire is for these believers that they might make it to glory. Look back to verse 11. This is the climaxing, beautiful, uh, precious, and magnificent promises that God gives to us. In this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, believer who's been given faith, will be abundantly supplied to you. It's just abundantly supplied, come into glory. It's just that you couldn't have a greater welcome or greeting into the eternal kingdom. And there was a danger going on in these churches. False teachers have infiltrated the church. Uh, most often where these false teachers come and attack is on the gospel of grace. And they start teaching that it's not free. And you've got to add something to it instead of just the 100% free grace of God done in Jesus Christ. And then they attack sanctification, the way we grow as Christians, and the power that comes through faith in these promises that bring about conformity to Christ. And the truth is, you cannot even begin to grow until you settle the gospel of Jesus Christ in your heart and then seek conformity to Him because you are forgiven and you are accepted this day by faith. So what you need to fight, false doctrine, Peter says is full assurance. You need to be certain of your calling and election, your growing conformity to Christ. And what can you do with people like that? Peter's going to willingly walk to a cross, be crucified upside down because of this great hope. And these are the ones, as we've been learning, that have epignosis, this, this full knowledge, this heart knowledge of God, not just facts in your head. People who get this gospel and it's changing you and growing you and causing you to live in a different way. The bottom line is the epinosis of Jesus Christ leads you to a life of love, not a big head with a lot of factual knowledge, but the power of God that flows into our lives as we believe and trust these promises of God. The life of a proper response flows supernaturally out of our union and our communion with Christ. So in light of these things now, Peter is going to open up his pastoral heart to us this morning, and he'll tell us why he does what he does as a leader in the church of God. And I, I love when great leaders open up their hearts and share what drives them, what motivates them. And, and Peter's going to give that to us this morning, and I pray it will stir your hearts and encourage you the way it has with me this week. Let's go to our God and pray for worship and blessing upon our time in the Word of God. Father, we come before you, and I thank you that you've given us a word that has been inspired by you. Father, what a privilege. And what we're going to look at now are the words of God. And I pray that you would unfold them. I pray that your Spirit would come and just open them up so that we understand them. God, make them clear, make them simple to us. And that our hearts then would be strangely warm toward our God and our wills would be bent, that we would walk out of this place more devoted to consecrating our lives to you and to you alone. God, break us from sins, these promises of this world that are promising pleasure, and they never truly deliver. God, let it be driven out with greater promises this morning from the Word of God. Meet us, we pray, for your name's sake. Amen. We're going to be in verses 12 through 15 uh, this morning. In verse 12, Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and haven't been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, 
knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be, there's our word again, diligent, that at any time after my departure, you'll be able to call these things to mind. And so again, this is a glimpse inside Peter's heart, his pastoral passion for why he's writing this letter. And so I want to give you an outline to help us understand this morning. We're going to look at at five points uh, of what Peter is is driving home to us. And we're going to look at first his, his seriousness for ministry. And then we're going to look at his sensitivity of ministry, his sowing in ministry, that you've been established in this truth. And then this season that God has given to him in ministry, the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. And so I want you to take up this first point with me, Peter's seriousness for ministry. And if you'll look in verse 12, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things. And so we begin with therefore, and I don't know if it's possible to wear out a word, but I think I might be getting close. When I was a kid, they used to sell this thing called 45 records. Some of you will remember those. And I would go buy them and come home and play it 58 times till my parents would make me pretty much throw it away. I just like wearing things out again and again and again. So I'm going to use self-control. Uh, that was one of the fruits in verse 6 that Peter said we need to grow in. And I'm not going to get lost in this word, but I will say a few thoughts. What is it there for? This glorious gospel that makes you a partaker of the divine nature. You just can't overstate that. The, now you have everything necessary for life and godliness to grow and to gain full assurance, make your calling and election sure. Your entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. This is so sweet and beautiful, what we have in the gospel. And Peter's saying, because of that, I will always be ready to remind you of these things. In verse 15, you will be able to call these to mind after I'm gone. So why is Peter always ready then to remind you of these things? Because they're just so important. They're why this world exists, why you exist, why anything matters this morning. These are real, weighty, eternal matters. This is, this is what you've got to care about and be concerned about. So Peter said, I'll never get tired of reminding you about what's real because this world keeps telling you everything that's not real and it will make you happy. I will keep doing this. Well, wait a minute, Peter. If, they, if they're that important, and these things are so deep and profound, amazing grace, why do you have to keep being ready to remind me? This should be the easiest thing in the world to keep before you. It should be easy, you would think. But all hell and the world and your flesh is set against you, keeping this reality at the center of your heart. You, you have so much fighting you from keeping this beautiful principle and truth right at the core. I, I read that quote a few weeks ago from John Newton, and he said, this is the hardest thing for me to keep at the forefront of my life. And it, it just, it's hard to just keep it there. And this has been and still is my battle this morning to keep this central as the controlling truth of my life. It needs to be the north star of our life. And so this truth in my heart, it, it loves to wander. And it's prone to leave the God I love. It loves to put other stuff at the center. And it just gets away quicker than, than some of my millennial friends when they hear the word work. It's just gone. Boom. <laughs> and I'll just say, we got some of the best millennials in the country here that work hard. But you would think... This would be the easiest thing ever to keep at your forefront. It's so beautiful. Peter said it's precious and magnificent. It should be easy. It's just too good to be true, the gospel of grace. And I need to be reminded again and again of it. And so this is the calling of the minister, the calling of the body of Christ. We all have a ministry of remembrance to each other. This is why we need the Word of God. I need it daily to remind me, to bring me back to this this is why I need you guys to fellowship and get together and talk about our hope and truth. It's why we need communion with Christ. It's why we need authors who have walked with Him to draw us closer and nearer to Him. We're on the battle of the 
Christian life right here, it's the battle of remembrance. And this has been the problem ever since the fall. Before the fall, Adam doesn't have to battle remembrance. He's walking with God. He sees him. And glory, I will no longer need anyone to stir up my remembrance ever again. I'm just going to live in the fullness of his glory and beauty by eyes, presence. It's going to be excellent. But until that day, because we have already been redeemed, but not yet fully for this return of Christ, because the tent that we are in this morning called a body, because of this world and its power, the enemy is still a roaring lion. He hasn't been thrown into the lake forever yet. I need help remembering. I got to fight to, to keep remembering. My devotions have been in Deuteronomy and it just again and again, he's coming back to remembrance and I'm going to read to you just a little section in there of Deuteronomy 6 verse 1. <clears throat> now this is the commandment the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you're going over to possess it. You're about to come into the promised land so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life and that your days then might be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I'm commanding you today, they shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons, And you shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you didn't build. All the houses full of all good things which you didn't fill, and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. All this mercy you shall eat and be satisfied. Then watch yourself, lest you forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. Will you never forget the bondage to sin that you have been brought out from? And may you always keep fighting to remember the glory and the beauty of this gospel of salvation. I want you to listen to a couple of verses. The whole, the whole Testament is just strewn with these calls of remembrance. They would set up places of remembrance all, all along the journey to call to mind the great acts of God toward them. On Passover, this annual reminder of God's great delivery from their bondage in Egypt. Uh, Deuteronomy 7.18, you shall not be afraid of them. Yet you shall well remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and all of Egypt. Remember that mighty washing away in the Red Sea. Deuteronomy 8.2, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years. Don't forget God's faithfulness to you in that wilderness that he would humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And then in Deuteronomy 8, It shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so you shall perish because you would not listen to the voice of the Lord your God. You forgot. And Psalm 88, 12. Will thy wonders be made known in the darkness and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? So prone to forget. One preacher put it well, he said, our flesh causes us to remember what we should forget and to forget what we should never forget. We're just prone to forget. And so we've got to keep fighting for this remembrance. Just flip in Second Peter, flip over to chapter 3. I just want to read to you one more verse and we'll get moving. Verse 1. This is now, beloved, the second letter that I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken 
by your apostles. I, I want to stir it up by way of remembrance. James 1, don't just be hearers of the word and, and, and not doers who hear the word of God and you walk out and you forget what you look like. You're like a man who looks in the mirror. Here I am. You walk away. I don't even remember what I look like. We're so prone to forget that we got this call of ministry of remembrance. This is our battle. We forget. If I remembered, I would never struggle with sin again. I just forget. It gets away. We had a guy here who used to teach the children's uh, Sunday school. He was a geophysicist. His name was Mr. Bill. And you kids, some of you remember, you got to high five him if you got the answers right. And he was just a genius. And he said to me when we were back at the school, he said, you know, pastor, you really don't teach me anything new. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> but you remind me of what I need to get back in the forefront. And I walked away kind of deflated. And I thought that was kind of prideful to say, I've got nothing left to learn really. But later, and surely this week, I think I know what he was saying, is these main tenets of the Christian faith, they're, they're not new. They're the old paths that we come back to, maybe from different angles, but we need to be reminded again and again and again to hold these things so that our way will be abundantly supplied when we come into that kingdom. How often do you need to be reminded that he's coming again? That's going to be his point in this section, that Jesus is coming again. What that should do to us, when we start thinking this life is it and it's forever and it's all that matters, we'll never grow, we'll never progress. And so I need this constant reminder and remembrance, he's coming again. And it could be today, come Lord Jesus. And so come back to, to verse 12, therefore, Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things. I'm always going to be there. My ministry is reminding you. And again, maybe new slants from the writer, but it's based on his flow and his thoughts. But my goal with every truth that I teach you is that you get epinosis. I want you to get it. I want you to so let these truths get into your life and your mind and your heart and change you. We got to keep fighting for these things and looking at them till you get epinosis. I don't want to be a church that just knows all the doctrine, but does not have love. It does not have a practical outworking of the truth. And some of you sit here this morning guilty. I don't want to know every argument and nuance of the second coming. And it makes no difference in your life to be holy and filled with hope. And whatever you're facing this morning is, is your epinosis of a return of Christ giving you hope and lifting you and fueling you. Or is it just data with charts that aren't producing a life of godliness? Epigenosis of Jesus Christ and all his glory and his return changes lives. John MacArthur said the first time you hear the truth, he said it's like hammering a nail into a piece of wood. You, you place it and you hammer it again and again from a different angle until it's all the way in until you get epigenosis. And so you just keep looking at it again and again. God, let this get in. Get it, let it change the way I live and think this day. We're so prone to forget. I heard a great stat last week in studying. This guy did a survey and he said one hour after a sermon, people have forgotten 90% of what was said. It's very encouraging. <laughs> Between him and Bill Wepfer, I feel great. But it, it helps you not take yourself too seriously. <clears throat> but I think the answer to that point is long introductions and reviews. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm always ready to remind you of these things. Amen? Repeat it. Introduce it. Just keep coming back again and again. Peter just justified my whole ministry. Thank you, Jesus. I love that point. Let's look at it again. So the first point is Peter's seriousness for ministry. I will always be ready to remind you of these things because of the therefore. There's so much at stake. Your eternal soul, I will never get tired of this. Second point, Peter's sensitivity to ministry in verse 12. Even though you already know them. When someone keeps reminding you of stuff you already know, it can make you feel condescended. Like, uh, I, I get this. Can we get on already, Pastor? Do you think I'm ignorant? And here... You see Peter's sensitivity to his flock. 
I'm always ready to remind you of these sweet truths about Christ, yet I acknowledge you already know them. (laughs) You already get them. What meekness and tenderness. I know that you know these things. You have believed them. You know this. You, you, most of you in this room have epinosis on these truths. I'm watching it change your lives. I'm just reminding you again and again, and I'm always ready to do this because we forget. And we learn them deeper based on life situations and trials and growth and just different times where you come to the Word and you, you learn them different. I was thinking back to Christ's prediction of Peter's denial. Peter, you're going to deny me three times but you're not going to fail because I prayed for you. And he says, Peter, when you turn again, strengthen your brothers. Establish the brethren. And here we see he had done that. You guys already know him. Peter's been doing this. You, 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 you're strength and I'm establishing you in truth. And so this is big because many in this church were established in the word and same thing here. And then this is for us. And so he's saying, church, Southside Bible, we need epigenosis. We've got to keep growing in that because we're established. There's a lot of deep, grounded, doctrinal people at this church. We need to be reminded again and again to fight familiarity, to not let it fall off like water off a duck's back. I've got to keep fighting to have these truths central and, and affecting me and changing my life. And so Peter's sensitivity to ministry is, uh, you already know them. I know that you know that. So let's look at his third point, Peter's sowing in ministry, still in verse 12. And that you have been established in the truth which is present with you. So here's the responsibility of the teacher. A sowing ministry that you would be established in the truth. Peter's already said it, you need to grow in knowledge. You have to be growing in knowledge. You have to labor in the Word of God. You've got to be established in it. The the people who run from it and say, all I want is just love and action and we don't need this truth, you're wrong. He's saying you've got to build a foundation. You've got to be established on it. The old song, how firm a foundation you saints of the Lord is laid up for you in His excellent Word. There's a foundation, there's a sowing. You've got to be diligent to get this foundation. And you have to know them. And you have to understand them. And you've got to understand the place in the flow of the Bible. You've got to understand the flow of the Bible. You need systematic theology to, so you don't get lost in error. And you need to know, how does this apply to my life? How does it get worked out in godly living? I have to be established in this Word. Any church that lets go of this for the sake of ministry, the sake of outreach, or the sake of social justice will quickly fall from grace. The two are married. In our day and age, truth and doctrine are seen as as, as enemies. (laughs) You know, it's it's enemies with love and outreach. And, And God's joined them together, and Peter has joined them together through the Holy Spirit. And it's just truth and love. And you have to give yourself to the Word of God to be established. Truth is the only way you can get to epinosis. You've got to labor in this thing and be praying, how do I get this to live this kind of a life? This is so important because Peter got this. Peter was in the inner three of the apostles. And Jesus taught them, if you'll go through the Gospels, he taught them the same truths again and again in different ways and in different parables. But at the end of his ministry with them, he said, you still don't get it. How long have I been with you and you still don't know who I am? Then his, his, Peter's great defection comes and he denies them three times. And Peter gets this. You've got you to be grounded in this. You've got to really have a bedrock when you start getting tested with your very life. You better have these things in your mind and in your heart. It's coming to America near you. Peter heard it from Jesus. He had a lot of truth and he forgot it. And it failed him at that moment. We need daily reminders and Peter knew it better than anyone. I was teaching Romans 3 in our community group, and we were looking at faith bringing about righteousness a few weeks ago in our community group. And a lady who's been at Southside for almost 20 years, she's never missed a Bible study anytime, anywhere. And she said, God just set me free from six-month depression with lack of assurance in Romans in that one night 
with a truth she's heard probably a thousand times, and it broke in. And it set her free from that bondage and that what the enemy was doing with her soul. And so we need to, to lay this foundation. So look with me. Peter's seriousness for ministry, I'll just keep reminding you. His sensitivity, even though you already know this, and his continual sowing that you've been established in the truth which is present in you. And we'll close out with our last point, Peter's settledness in ministry. In verse 13, I consider it right as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. <coughs> and I will be diligent that at any time after my departure, you're going to be able to call these things to mind. So in light of this, Peter says, I consider it right as long as I'm alive to stir you up by way of reminder. As long as I'm in this earthly dwelling, uh, this word for tent, it's, it's what Israel lived in for much of its sojourn in the Old Testament. Uh, it, it's such a great way, I really think, to consider our lives that my, I'm in a tent. My body is a tent. A tent is temporary and it's transient. This body is not my all and all. You know what that could do for Americans? Just hear that. Your body's not your all and all. This body's a tent that I'm living in until the Lord calls my name. It's a box for my soul to live in. And my outer man is decaying, but my inner man's being renewed day by day. That's what Peter's saying. Renew the inner man. Build with truth. Get epinosis. Build the inner man. And this outer man, it is going to decay and wear out and die. It's a shell. It's a tent that will be taken down. But as long as I'm in this tent, my body, <coughs> Peter says it's only right to stir you up by way of reminder of these beautiful truths that we've looked at in verses 1 through 11. That is my lifelong calling. Peter says there's no retirement. As long as I have a tent, as long as God gives me breath and gives me a life, I will stir you up by way of reminder of these truths of Jesus Christ. All the way to the end. That's my calling. Stir up one another by way of reminder. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Stir me up again and again. Parents, don't ever grow weary. Stir, stir each other up in these truths. Never grow weary in it. Again and again and again because we forget. And I'll do this until I leave my tent, Peter says, until I leave my post. I will stir you up. And that Greek word, it meant to wake you up from sleep or lethargy. You, you get sleepy. You, you get lethargic. And you start meandering. And really, that's our battle. And Peter's saying, I'll never get tired of reminding you of Christ and his beauty and his excellencies to stir you up again. What we read today, be steadfast because of this resurrection of Christ, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that you're not laboring in vain. <laughs> okay? Don't grow weary. Believers get lazy and they get drowsy and they're not on the alert. And we remind each other so that we might stir each other up to love and good deeds. The blessed ministry of reminding. I had a favorite singer when I was first saved. His name was Keith Green. Keith Green was a zealot for the Lord. And they said he would literally grab you and rebuke you and say, Jesus is worthy of more. He couldn't stand apathy. And just... How, how can you give Jesus so little when he gave you everything? And, and if you're loafing and being lazy, he would come and say, come on, remember what he did, let's go. Go, therefore. The true sign of spiritual growth is not needing something new, but just needing to be reminded of the fullness and the beauty of Christ. That satisfying your soul. And so Peter's seriousness for ministry I will never stop doing this. His sensitivity, even though you already know them. His sowing, you've been established in the truth which is present with you. And then Peter's settledness in ministry, I'm going to do this uh, just again and again. I'm going to keep reminding. And then my last point. I told you four, but you get a fifth one. Okay, get that? Yeah, fifth one. Peter's season in ministry. And that really is verses 14 through 15, is the laying aside of my earthly dwelling, Peter says, 
is imminent. And so this is really cool. In John 21, you'll remember when we started 1 Peter, Peter was told of his death, and it was going to be by crucifixion. He lets Peter know you're going to get bound and taken where you don't want to go. You're going to be martyred. And Christ made it very clear to Peter. Peter says, Jesus told me. Can you imagine living most of your life knowing for certain it's going to end in martyrdom on a cross? It's kind of what Christ did. He knew it. And now Peter is being told, it's soon, Peter. I told you in John 21 it's coming, but it's imminent and it's right upon you. What would you do if you knew that? Would you go visit the world? Spend more time with your grandkids? What would you do if you knew that? Your, your time's done. Crucifixion's around the corner. Peter says, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be diligent to keep reminding you of these great truths so after I'm gone, you have them. You can call them to mind. You're living them out. You own these things. That's what I'm going to do. And if you give me another week, I'll do that. I'm going to be diligent. I will not quit telling you about the glories of Christ. I was thinking this week about with my own kids, what do I want to leave this group? And it's pretty simple. I, I want to leave this. I want to leave a group that knows and loves Christ. Southside, what do I want to leave you when I depart this tent? Well, it's this. The sweetness of Christ and our sure hope that you would stand firm till you abundantly get supplied your entrance into the eternal kingdom. I really don't need to go see the world. I don't need to buy an RV and just travel and take it all in because I can do that in glory. As Piper says, I don't need to buy a yacht and collect seashells. But I want you to hear this because it's going to be a temptation to every one of you to do that. What you need to do with your life is to be diligent, to keep reminding everyone around you of Jesus Christ and these glories and these beauties. That was Peter's response. Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to be diligent to keep telling you. This is a call to our Nike group to keep sowing these things into the younger generation and telling them of a Christ that has been worthy for you of your whole life to hold to Him and live for Him and to keep showing them I'll die for Him and to keep bringing it and telling it to the younger group. And the younger ones, you listen. Ask them, learn from the people that this Christ was enough and brought them through their life and is going to bring them to glory. And I think the Nike group should be 60 and older till I turn 60, okay? <laughs> I was hard on a 50-year-old. <clears throat> At the end of Peter's life, I want you to hear this. He sped up. He didn't slow down. <laughs> the ministry of remembrance, he just kept going. Oh, I realize I'm going. I realize I'm finishing the race. I'm going to be more diligent to keep telling you about Christ and sowing Him into my children, my flock, anyone who will listen. I pray that every one of you in this room will leave a legacy. A legacy of remembrance of the only things that really matter. I want to come to your funeral. And I don't want to hear about your hobbies and all the funny things that you did. I want to hear person after person stand up there and say he was a broken clock always reminding us about Jesus and his love and his soon return. That's what he was about. That's what she was about. Come talk about that. Give them Jesus. If you have young kids, I'm going to call you parents right now. The most important thing in your life right now is that you just keep sowing this in them again and again and again. It is a privilege to have these little ones in your home, and they are so pliable to hear about Christ and His teachings. And I beg you to redeem this time. Don't get tired. Sow it in them again and again and again. If you have teenagers, here you go. Don't grow weary with teenagers. And keep telling them. There's times that, that are acting like they're not even listening. And they're going to get older and come back to you and say, I was listening, Dad, Mom. I'm telling you, just keep sowing. And love those teenagers. And stick, keep telling them again and again. Older kids, here you go. They go off. Keep telling them. Keep encouraging them in Christ as they have their own kids. Grandparents, pour into these little ones. 
Just keep generation after generation. If you're single, here you go. I love what Rick Hallahan's doing with a college group, pouring in all of his epigenosis into these young men and women day in and day out. Don't get tired of it. Just keep telling them, sowing it again and again. And after I die, I just want you to be able to call these things to mind. Amen? This will only come from people who have epigenosis. The knowledge that I passed on, if it's just knowledge, you know what? When I die, it's gone. But epigenosis, as I want them to know the fullness of Christ and how trustworthy He is, I want to leave that to my kids, not a, a dad with a bunch of head knowledge that never lived it out. I want to give them that, a man that loved Jesus Christ and would never stop. That's what Peter had. He had one string on his banjo. Jesus, I will keep telling you about him and the truth regarding him until I put this tent down and you enter into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and it will be abundantly supplied to you. Isn't that so good? Listen to what has been recorded for us of Peter's death. Peter had to watch his wife be crucified. And we're told by some writers of that era, he kept telling her as she's being crucified, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Don't forget all these things that you know and are in your heart. You're going to be resurrected and you're going to dwell with him forever. Remember the Lord. And then it's his turn and he remembered and he walked and said, I am not worthy to be crucified like my Savior. Do it upside down. Remember this sweet Christ. And may we so get these and be reminded of them that we walk to our deathbeds, whatever kind the Lord chooses, and we remember the Lord. And here today you'll be with me in paradise. Faith in all of Him and what He has done, cemented in our hearts. And I've told you this so many times, but if I come to your hospital bed and you're on a ventilator, and I walk in that room and I whisper, Jesus is all, you're safe. Look at him. The good shepherd is with you in the valley. And a smile will come over your face because you know it. You have epigenosis and you're safe and you're not afraid and you're ready to just go into the presence of this Christ. And I've seen that again and again with the saints of this church who have gone into the shadow of the valley because they did have this epignosis because we just keep reminding you from every angle of the beauties and the sweetness of Christ. And so this is so sweet, what we have in Christ. I just want to keep reminding each other of this until we have never, we will never forget again. And then we will remember it for all of eternity. Yeehaw. We have a good end. And so I just pray, guys, let's keep holding to this sweet Christ. Hold him all the way at my cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. Let's, let's have a ministry of remembrance to help each other to get to this abundantly supplied eternal life. Amen? Let's go to our Lord and pray. Oh, Father, I thank you for this Christ. Lord, why would, would we want to waste such beauty with just head knowledge? Oh, God, let these truths cause us to abide and treasure and draw near to Jesus Christ. God, let this knowledge be so epinosis that it conforms us to the image of this Christ. And God, I pray that every believing soul in here will never grow weary of reminding one another. I pray that every teacher and elder in this church will never grow weary of lifting up the glories and the beauties of Jesus Christ. I pray that your people will never get tired of hearing of the glories and beauties of Christ. Let us fight to not be lethargic and apathetic most people's love is going to grow cold in these end days. God, don't let ours. Let us fight for it as a body. Let us help each other and keep our hands on that sweet Christ until we see him with our own eyes. God, thank you for the blessing of Peter and what he has laid out to us here this morning. We praise you and we thank you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. 
The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.